Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Conversations on Retail. My name is Matt Pfeiffer. I'm the founder and CEO of Supplier Community, and uh, we are joined this afternoon by Matthew Boyle, who's a senior reporter with Bloomberg News, covers uh, all of retail and CPG. And uh, as most of you would know, because you've been on these before, Conversations on Retail is really our opportunity to spend time getting to know uh, people that well, for me to get to know people that have over the years really, really fascinated me in terms of the work that they do, the contributions that they've made. But they're people that, quite frankly, I, I don't know. And uh, most of the conversations we've had with founders and with CEOs, we spend a lot of time talking about backstory, childhood, upbringing, what were the things that kind of been, you know, helped them to discover capabilities and passions and those sorts of things. But we're going to do that with Matt as well. But I really want to spend more time this afternoon talking with him about kind of the world as he sees it, because he, he's got what I think is the best job in the world. And I, I've spent the last 20 years talking about myself as a student of retail, having worked uh, for, for Walmart for a good number of years, and then working uh, with and for and among the supplier community uh, in a variety of capacities over the last several years. Uh, I've always considered myself to be a student of retail, but I feel like Matt has got this, you know, this extraordinary job where he is kind of, you know, able to to listen in on conversations and and do some reading in between the lines and 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 maybe have a, a little bit better idea than most of us where things are are going so uh matt thank you so much for making this time i know we've had a couple of false starts um, yeah. where we both both have had things that have have come up and um i appreciate uh your flexibility and especially your your generosity with respect to, to your time so thank you so much for joining us no problem. I mean, it's a pleasure, particularly to talk to this this community you have here. I mean, these are the people that I love to hear from a lot. Um, and you talk about me being knowledgeable. The only reason I'm knowledgeable is because of the graciousness of people in the Walmart community, whether that's inside the company or outside, who you know who are kind enough to talk to me. Well, and I think that's a really a really good point because your your motivation for being here beyond beyond just being a, a good guy and and you know, being generous with your time, you know, toward, toward me and toward this community, but you're, you're obviously uh, in, in this to, to make new contacts and, and to uh, discover new sources, uh, you know, for, uh, for insight and for information and for context. Um, so we'll make sure that folks have your contact information uh, at the end in the event that they would ever want to reach out uh, to, to you. And uh, I know relationships are key in your business. As I mentioned, I love to start these conversations with a little bit of a background. We don't have to dig super, super deep into your childhood, but I would like to hear kind of the the, the short version, if you will, of 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 your your upbringing and and the thing that I'm most curious about. You know, I know about you know Princeton and baseball. Carrie did a really nice job in her her conversation with you, and I enjoyed listening to that. But really, what was it in early in your life that that uh, helped you to discover? This, this ability, maybe it's a passion, I'd love to hear if it is, for, for, for telling stories and, and for, for writing in particular. Yeah, I mean, it certainly started just from reading, of course. I know that's the obvious answer, um, yeah. but you know, reading tons. And I think I also read, I, you know, I read the usual stuff that most kids would read, you know, The Lion, The Witch, and The Wardrobe, and all that yeah. good stuff. But I also gravitated a lot towards biographies, you know, historical fiction and historical biographies. And these would be a people that I just had heard about, you know, maybe my parents talked about them, but I didn't really know much about them. So, you know, people you'd expect like Abraham Lincoln um, in terms of presidents, Jackie Robinson, you know, who, of course, I'm too young to have ever seen play. But my dad's from Brooklyn, you know, and, you know, um, so I wanted to learn a little bit more about that. And you start reading these biographies and you kind of learn how journalists think and work. You learn a little bit about how historians work. So that kind of got me in towards uh, thinking about history as sort of a major in college. And it certainly was my favorite subject in high school. And I was able to, you know, to study at American history at college. And what I really focused on there was sort of figuring out, you know, to really study history, of course, as you know, or as we should know now, it's not just names and dates and facts. Yeah. I mean, you, you do that in history, you're gonna bore everyone to tears. You got to understand what are the motivations of people? Why did they do the things they did? And, you know, and the responses to those actions, of course. So, you know, you got to figure out where did people come from? Did they have an ax to grind? And you do that in history anyway, by reading, you know, first person accounts. You know, you don't just want to read what some academics said 100 years later. You want to read, you know, 
what Frederick Douglass actually wrote about being a slave, for example. And that's especially valuable in my time now because I talk to loads of people all the time and I need to really quickly figure out, just as anyone in business really, but particularly journalists, you know, I need to figure out, are they credible or not? Do they just have an ax to grind? You know, for example, with Walmart, are they just talking to me about Walmart because they just got fired last week? Right. And, you know, they're really unhappy and they just want some hit piece written. You know, you have right. to quickly figure out, okay, that's not a person I really need to trust. I'll listen to them for 10 minutes, mm -hmm. but that's not something I'm gonna base a story on. So it's really that grounding in history and first person accounts that sort of taught me, you know, I think a lot um, uh, about being a journalist, in addition to just reading and writing a ton. You know, that's what, of course, helps any journalist. You just have to be able to just write about just about anything quickly um, and authoritatively. Well, and I'm just thinking, as you say that, I mean, how much more, and the media has always been accountable, but there just seems to be this um, uh, tremendous, tremendous, tremendous attention being paid right now. And, and it's becoming more and more difficult to, to really determine who and, and what you can even you know, believe anymore. So yeah. uh, I, I, under, I understand exactly uh, what you're talking about. So how did you end up at Princeton, choosing Princeton, uh, going to Princeton? What was that experience like? Um, it was, you know, and now that I think back about it, you know, I, I didn't put too much thought into it, to be honest. I remember mm -hmm. back when U.S. News and World Report would do those college rankings. I think they still yeah. do, them, but they're probably yeah. online. And I remember my mom giving me a copy and being like, OK, you know, go pick a college. I mean, that's how that's that's what it um, has scientific as it was. And I knew I wanted to do history. That's really all I knew. I didn't know anything else about campuses. You know, I kind of knew that I wanted to be far enough away from my house that I felt like going away, but I didn't really want to go to California or, you know, across the country. So I said, yeah, okay, what's around the East Coast that's got a really good history program? And Princeton jumped out immediately. It had a good history program back then, of course, still does. And, you know, it kind of helped that my uh, grandfather had attended there. Mm -hmm. Although be between us and uh, you, me, and the rest of the supplier community, he actually never graduated. Mm -hmm. um, he was recruited to play uh, football back in the day when Princeton's football team was like, you know, on par with Notre Dame and, and, mm -hmm. the, and Army and the best schools in the nation. And let's just say he, he got to Princeton, but had a little bit too much fun while he was there. Yeah. And, and back in those days, you didn't get expelled, you know, from a place like Princeton. They just politely asked you to leave. So he was politely <laughs> asked to leave. So while he was a member of the class of 1930, he never actually graduated. He doesn't have a degree. Mm -hmm. But of course, back then in the 20s, you know, if you at least had, you know, attended Princeton, you could still start a very good career. So it's not like right. it really hurt him, uh, you know, never actually getting his college degree. But that, of course, you know, enhanced the appeal to me, like, oh, wow, my granddad went there. This is interesting. And then once you, you know, once you visit, you know, you're just totally absorbed and, you know, enamored with the campus. Obviously, yeah. you know, the students and the faculty there are top notch. So it wasn't a tough sell. You know, once I was able to get in, um, get accepted through our early decision, you know, that was really my sole focus. Like, OK, that's where I'm going. Yeah, you played you played baseball. I I remember you telling Kerry you weren't a, you don't wouldn't briefly, consider yeah. yourself a great <laughs> baseball player, but you played baseball for Princeton, which is a big deal. Played, uh, yeah, briefly and not very well. I was not a top recruit. So I, I remember arriving on the first day of practice and seeing about nine first basemen ahead of me, and I said, "Okay, mm. that's what this right. is going to be like." But you know, there it's all about the experience. It's who you meet, it's the friends you make along the way. So that's how I got into journalism, though. Actually, was that after freshman year a year spent, you know, playing JV, having a lot of fun, but, you know, I kind of realized if you play college, you know, if you play uh, collegiate athletics, it's a huge time commitment and you really got to be getting something out of it. So I said, well, you know, I'm not getting as much out of this as I thought I would. Um, so what else is there, you know, what else is out there? And I thought, okay, well, you know, if I can't play sports, maybe I could write about sports. Uh -huh. And so literally just walked in the front door of the college newspaper and said, hey, do you need any sports writers? And of course, you know, any college newspaper is always happy to have newbies walk in and, you know, sure. be willing to volunteer. So they immediately put me on the beat. You know, I remember my first, um, one of my first interviews actually was amazing. It, it was with Bob Bradley, um, mm -hmm. who was then the coach of Princeton soccer team, but he went mm -hmm. on to coach the U.S. men's national team. Right. Um, and it's now a very big deal. Um, he was one of my first interviews. And I went mm -hmm. in, of course, completely unprepared, you know, with just some 
couple of lame questions about, you know, how's the team going to do this year? Not knowing that I was sitting in front of, you know, possibly one of the greatest, you know, American, uh, uh, you know, soccer uh, people of, of all time. Um, but that's really how it, how it happened. I found I really liked it. I liked the people, you know, the deadlines got, got you know, get to be a bit of a rush, you know, um, back then we didn't do much digitally at all. You literally placed the type you know, hmm. um, you know, into the press and, and, and sent it to the printing press at night. So, you know, you do that once in a while, you, you, you bash out a story on deadline. It gives you a little bit of a rush, obviously makes you a better writer in general. So um, that's how it started really for me in journalism. Well, so prior to that point, what had, what had been your occupational goals? You were studying at Princeton, you know, with a, you, you know, passionate about reading, passionate about history. What, to that point, what had you intended to do after you graduated before you fell in love with sports writing? I mean, between us, Matt, I had no idea, really. Mm. I really mm. did not. I didn't go in um, thinking, well, I, I want to come out of this with, you know, and go to law school or go to medical school. You know, as you can imagine, a lot of my uh, classmates there went into investment banking or finance. Um, a lot certainly went into, you know, law a lot went into management consulting, you know, Bain and McKinsey and, and those places mm. recruit heavily. But I didn't really, you know, see much appeal to any of that. And part of me, and so I graduated not having a job, you know, unlike mm. I think a lot of my classmates who graduated knowing that they were going to go to law or med school or that there, there was a job at, you know, McKinsey or Goldman Sachs waiting for them. Um, I didn't have anything. And I literally, I went home. Uh, after after I sobered up from all the graduation parties, um, I'm pretty sure either my mom or dad threw, the, threw that day's copy of the New York Times to me and said, mm -hmm. hey, go find a job. Well, here's the want ads, you know. Yeah. Again, I'm dating myself. Uh, you know, I didn't go on Indeed or, or Monster.com. I don't right. think around them. But, like, you know, I found my first job in journalism in the uh, New York Times classifieds. Hmm. And and you did your time uh, at, you know, Simba Information and PR Week before you what I would call from the outside looking in your first big break, which is at Fortune. And I want to hear about that in just a second. But one of the things I, I failed to mention when we started, uh, one of the benefits of being kind of a live uh, attendee and listening in on this conversation is you've got the ability to, to submit questions to Matt. And we're going to spend uh, quite a bit of time in the next few moments kind of digging into the world as, as he sees it and how uh, his perspective on kind of this post-COVID retail world and, and um, you know, what now and what's next. So if you've got questions, I would encourage you to hit the Q&A button uh, on your screen and, and begin to submit those questions now. And, and, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll make sure we, we integrate those and, and take as, um, as many as he's got time to answer. So again, did, did your time, ended up at Fortune Magazine. Kind of give us uh, a, a bit, again, a bit of a summary because I want to get into the, into the good yeah. stuff. Uh, give us a summary summary of your your career as a, as a journalist and how you ended up in this unbelievable job with Bloomberg. Yeah, well, I mean, I'll focus on fortune, as you say, that was my real big break. And it and again, it was it was pretty lucky. I mean, I, I ended up at fortune um, in the late 90s, just during the dot com boom. And if you remember, you know, um, if you were reading business magazines back then, like Fortune, mm -hmm. Forbes and Business Week, I mean, they were the size of phone books every other week. I mean, they were just chock full mostly, you know, ads for dot-com companies that no longer exist, but, but, you know, that's right, but it was also car companies, and, you know, advertising, let's say print advertising had not been ruined or disintermediated or whatever word you want to use by, you know, places like Craigslist, so it was still kind of the heyday of print journalism. It was the end of the heyday, certainly, but um, so when you have magazines that are that large, you need a lot of reporters to fill all of that yeah. copy space, and so, I lucked out, you know, Fortune was really going on a hiring binge and, you know, they were just looking for experience, you know, smart reporters. And I had a couple of connections there through college and so was able to parlay that into an interview, which led to a job. And I mean, there it was amazing being able to work with people like Carol Loomis, who's kind of the, you know, the dean of business journalism there at, uh, at Fortune. Um, so many other good senior reporters and editors um, you know, if you had a question about IBM, you could go talk to a guy at Fortune who wrote a book about IBM. I mean, that's how solid the, the staff was there. And so I was able to kind of grow up there at Fortune with a lot of other young journalists, kind of learn the craft. You know, if you learn from Carol Loomis how to fact check a story, you will learn how to fact check a story, you know, within an inch of its life. So that really helped. So I was there for eight years. But 
you know, I mentioned the dot-com boom, there was a dot-com bust after that. Mm -hmm. And Fortune Magazine, you know, was very much a part of that, not just covering it, but if you remember, Fortune was owned by Time Inc., which is part mm -hmm. of Time Warner, which was acquired by America Online in what right. was possibly the worst merger Least disaster <laughs> of, all right. time, of all time. And yeah. so as that merger slowly and then quickly began to crumble um, and advertising pages, all those dot-com advertising pages, you know, disappeared because the dot-coms disappeared. And as the internet slowly started to take, you know, more of the advertising um, away, uh, the ad pages shrunk and layoffs started. And while I dodged a few bullets here and there, you know, I got my first hard lesson, you know, in, in sort of corporate life in sort of what it was like to get laid off. Um, and that was in 2008, um, mm -hmm. where, you know, I wasn't a big enough deal for them to hold on to, but I was making enough at that point to sort of be a target. So, um, so in 2008, um, you know, they bid me farewell. Uh, but luckily, I kind of saw it coming and had already engineered a move over to Business Week, which is a rival to Fortune. And in my case was just, you know, didn't change my commute at all because right. it was really two blocks away yeah. in midtown Manhattan. A lot of the newspapers and magazines are right around there if you've ever visited. Um, and so went to Business Week um, in the, you know, in the fall of uh, 2008. And again, you know, coinciding with another massive shakeup, this time of the entire American economy, not just publishing and journalism, mm -hmm. um, you know, but you have the great financial crash of, of 2008, which was an amazing story to tell as a business journalist. Um, you know, we had literally no idea what was going to happen when we went into, you know, the, the office every day, you know, uh, Bear Stearns being acquired, you know, what, what, you know, what is going on? And so again, um, having to really think quickly, learn like, okay, how are companies grappling with this? Um, it was just a, a really fascinating time uh, to be in business journalism, certainly. Um, but, you know, at the same time that that is happening, uh, Business Week's parent company, McGraw-Hill, put Business Week on the block because of those reasons I outlined earlier, that advertising was falling off a cliff, uh, the, business, the magazine was losing money. And so after several months of a lot of uncertainty, not knowing where we're going to end up, uh, Mike Bloomberg, you know, <laughs> scraped some change together under his couch, I think, and uh, found enough to uh, to buy Business Week. Um, and I really didn't know much about Bloomberg at the time. I just thought Bloomberg was sort of, you know, this, this fancy data terminal for right. you know, Wall Street wizards and hedge fund dudes. Um, I didn't, I knew it had a news organization, but um, I didn't spend much time thinking about it. It wasn't really a close competitor at, at Fortune because Bloomberg was much more about, you know, breaking news and shorter stories versus yeah. Fortune and Business Week, which was what we call long form, you know, stories right. you sit back with um, at the end of the day and then you, you spend an hour reading a, a profile of, you know, Jack Welch or something like that. Um, but I didn't have much choice, you know, it was either. So I kind of had yeah. to interview for a job at, at Bloomberg, uh, luckily, you know, convinced them that I was worthy of, of hiring. And then uh, they just threw me onto what they call the, uh, the consumer team there. So um, I was, uh, again, a, around a lot of other young good journalists, but it was a much different approach to journalism at Bloomberg versus, uh, you know, Fortune. Um, and it's certainly a you know, similar audience, but um, I really had to flex different muscles uh, when I started working there. So fast forwarding, you've done some great work internationally with Bloomberg. I'd love to hear about that in brief and then kind of touch on what are your areas of responsibility today? Yeah, I mean, I've had a really good run at Bloomberg. I've been pretty lucky. Um, it's been 10 years now going on 11, about half of that in New York and half of that in, uh, in the UK, actually. Mm -hmm. um, I worked in our, our London bureau, um, and instead of covering Walmart, I was covering Tesco, you know, instead of Kraft and Kellogg, you know, it was Unilever and Nestle. Um, so it gave me a good perspective in terms of how the sort of European-based companies um, uh, sort of just, you know, uh, how they deal with uh, difficulties, challenges, how they structure their executive teams, just, you know, not huge differences with American companies, but subtle differences, certainly. I mean, one example would be their approach to uh, corporate sustainability um, and social responsibility. I think the European companies in particular, like Unilever, um, way ahead of you know, the US in terms of that. If you've ever listened to uh, the former CEO of Unilever, Paul Pullman speak um, you know, about to sort of profit with a purpose, 
Um, you know, I think he was years ahead of, you know, even Walmart when, when Walmart got religion on, uh, on sustainability, you know, under Lee Scott. So, um, so that was great, but I was ready to come back certainly to the States. Uh, you know, I love living in England. It's a great place. London is a fantastic city, uh, but I was ready to come back to the U.S. Um, our kids were entering those years where, you know, if we stayed in England any longer, I don't think we would have ever gotten them out of, of England. So came back to the U.S. in 2017 and um, started covering Walmart again. So this is actually my second go around covering, uh, covering Walmart and big box uh, retail. Um, and then quickly, you know, uh, made the same connections, made some new connections such as, such as you. And, and uh, um, it's, it's been a great, I mean, it's been a fascinating run. Again, you know, we have this sort of cataclysmic event of, of COVID and the pandemic. Um, so it's funny, I mean, I, I'm really dating myself here, but I say, you know, I've, I've covered business journalism. I covered 9-11, you know, I wrote obituaries yeah. for people who died in 9-11. Um, you know, I covered the great crash of 2008. I've now covered COVID and the pandemic. So um, all of those three were just, you know, extremely challenging times to be a business writer, but also extremely rewarding times. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I appreciate that. And this has been fun, you know, for me to kind of understand you and your background a, a little bit better, which is really kind of the, the point of these conversations. But I want to jump ahead now to talk about um, COVID-19, and there's so much that's been discussed and, and, and written, um, uh, but I, I would love to know, based on your perspective and the conversations that you've had and the things that you've seen, um, who, who have been the, the, the biggest winners and, and losers in terms of retailers and, and brands and direct-to-consumer players? Obviously, the cons in my opinion, at least, the consumer has been the biggest winner in, in all of this, but I'd love to hear your perspective on, um, yeah, yeah. Well, in terms of winners, you don't have to look very far outside your your door there, Matt. Yeah. I mean, Walmart's certainly um, one of the biggest winners. And, and for reasons that aren't probably going to shock your, you know, the, the folks listening on this call, it was that because they really had prepared themselves, um, uh, you know, for this e-commerce explosion, uh, thanks to Doug getting religion, Doug buying Jet, uh, bringing Mark Laurie on board. Um, really making that e-commerce operation, while it still has plenty of, of flaws and faults, of course, but making, you know, trying to put it at least on par with what Amazon was putting together and, and, and also better than certainly Amazon in certain areas like grocery, you know, um, you know, the number of times I hear from people like, oh, Amazon, you know, gets all the sales online. I'm like, have you, you know, have you ever shopped at, at walmart.com? Do you know how big a, you know, a bigger market share they have, particularly in online grocery? And how quickly they rolled out things like curbside, you know, going from just a couple hundred stores to, you know, in nearly the entire chain now. So that's why I think, well, so when COVID hit, of course, you know, Walmart was ready, whether shoppers, you know, and of course they were, they, they got lucky. They still had their stores open. They were deemed an essential retailer in a way that like, you know, the gap wasn't because they sold food. Um, but they were able to lean into that. You know, they, they went through the shortages. They went through the fact that nobody could find toilet paper or Clorox wipes, you know, for, uh, for a week or so. Um, and, you know, and, and were able to, to move on and, and succeed. But they're not alone. I mean, Target was another huge winner, uh, maybe even more so than Walmart, I would say. Uh, Home Depot, of course. Anybody selling things related to DIY or home improvement or home decor also did, you know, extraordinarily well. And let's not forget Amazon, of course. I mentioned Amazon right. in, in light of Walmart and the, and the eternal battle there, which I think is one of the greatest sort of business stories of our day. Um, but Walmart was, a, you know, I'm sorry, Amazon was a huge beneficiary here, um, uh, you know, once they figured out when they were going to do Prime Day, but um, it almost didn't matter. But the question I think really now is like, you know, it's not hard to figure out who were the pandemic winners. My question, the question we're trying to answer at Bloomberg now is, Who's going to hold on to all those new customers? Right. You know, we know the this rising tide lifted so many boats last year, uh, but you know who's going to get a bigger share of this growing pie? Whether it's in online grocery or in home decor, um, and that's where the moves that companies made last year, the adjustments they made, you know, um, figuring out, you know, how much source, you know, square footage do we really need? You know, um, how do we tweak our curbside offering? You know, look at Target, for example. Um, they now allow you, if you, sh if you shop drive up from Target, you can, you can say on the app where in your car you want the, uh, the bags put. It's, you know, that's a, that's a cool little thing. I'm sure maybe a lot of people, for, for, you know, 
that that makes sense for them you know don't put it in my trunk the dog is there yeah. you know so it's those adjustments those little adjustments that i think are going to really allow certain companies to hold on to a lot of the customers they acquired while others might lose them i mean we all know that grocery sales are going to go down this year they have to right you now there's right. no way in the world we're going to eat as many meals in the house this year yeah. as we did last year but how much is that going to is going to go to restaurants which restaurants are you know are going to benefit those are the questions um that are really interesting and that's why we need to talk to you know people like you people who have their finger on the pulse of whether it's, you know, uh, retailers, supply chain executives, um, to sort of figure this out. And that's where it kind of gets fun for me. It'll be interesting to see how much, you know, on, on the whole, our behaviors as consumers have, have really changed in the long term. For example, I remember when, when uh, Walmart, you know, plus, um, we we were an early adopter, not not the earliest, but we were an early adopter. And when we first signed up for it, like, oh my gosh, we will never go back to the stores again. But I, it's been a month, maybe five, six weeks since we've even used it. And I, I don't know, I don't know what that means precisely, but a lot of these things that we, we changed and, and become so enamored with and fell in love with so quickly, are we going to revert back to our the old life? That, that's what's going to be yeah. interesting to me to see. Well, that's a really good. I mean, what you, you just said. What does that What does that mean to me? The fact that you haven't used Walmart Plus in a few weeks. I think that says to Walmart they better get some new stuff added on to Walmart Plus pretty yeah. quick. And whether that's some sort of financial services offering, which would make a lot of sense. Hint, hint. You know, given what they've right. just announced with this new fintech startup that they aren't saying anything about yet. But they yeah. have said that Walmart Plus is going to have new services, and we all know it. You know, you, you're not just going to pay 98 bucks or whatever it is just, you know, just for the groceries and just for the fuel discounts. I mean, you can get fuel discounts from any retailer, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you get them from Kroger and just about any supermarket who's got a gas station. So I think, you know, uh, but Doug McMillan, you know, going back to your point about behaviors, though, we had a really interesting story today that I encourage you guys to read about the Clorox CEO. I saw um, that. The youngest, youngest CEO, yep. first female CEO, and uh, even she said, you know, she couldn't find Clorox wipes during the pandemic, yeah. and she is the CEO of Clorox. So that's when you yeah. know you've got a little bit of a supply chain issue. Um, but we, we of course asked her, you know, are people going to go back to their cleaning routines? You remember in May, uh, April and May of last year, we were wiping down everything that came to the house, right? I, right. I know I was, especially certainly our groceries. And right. even to this day, our, you know, Fresh Direct, which is what we use for groceries in New York, um, they won't take the, uh, the bags back, the reusable bags. They just say, chuck them. Um, so our question for, th for Clorox was, you know, are we really going to revert, um, you know, are, are, are we going to revert to our old cleaning routines? Are we going to incorporate some of what we did during COVID? And, you know, she claimed that 90% of, of people um, are going to maintain their sort of cleaning and sanitary routines. Now, that's their own research. So again, take that with a grain of salt. You know, this is the CEO of Clorox. You know, she's only going to share research. Probably that's going to benefit Clorox. Hmm. But put it this way, I'm going to a restaurant tonight. I'm really excited. It's my wife's birthday. We're going to see some friends we haven't seen in a while. And you know what? I am kind of wondering what's the restaurant's air filtration system like? You know, I might sure. just put a call in and be like, hey, you know, what do you got yeah. going there? I might just look around the restaurant when I think, you know, how's the ventilation here? Um, let's think about these things. And, you know, would you have thought about that two years ago? Of course not. Yeah. But no, that's where I think it'll be, you know, there's some things we'll adopt. Some behaviors will certainly adopt. I think a lot of behaviors will adopt, um, whether it's online shopping or, you know, calling a restaurant ahead of time and asking them about their, you know, uh, their uh, their ventilation yeah. system um and then it just kind of comes down to how much time do we have to do these things as well right i mean that's what right. retail the winners of retail are all about it's convenience it's prices as well as walmart and everyone else will tell you but um, it's that magic confluence of price and convenience is where the winners lie hmm. i i hadn't intended to ask you this question but but i am curious and it's been it's been some time back uh, certainly more than a year ago Amazon had so much momentum and there, there was a lot of murmuring in this community that my gosh, they're just, they're going to, they're going to win it all. They're going to take it all. And I wonder to what extent I'm not asking for your personal opinion. I'm asking, you know, based on the conversations you've had with, with executives at, in retail and in CPG, to what extent 
was was there a fear that that Am Amazon was going to take it all? And to what extent is there a belief now, maybe, that COVID was best thing that ever could have happened to, to Walmart's business? Um, I mean, it was not just Walmart. Again, I would say, yeah, from Target, Home Depot. Um, yeah. It kind of, you know, the pl for the places that were still open, you know, that you could still actually shop in. Um, you know, it was a fantastic time to remember, to remind Americans, you know, how important stores are. I mean, remember there's, you know, going to a grocery store for a lot of Americans is not just about buying bananas and, and bread, you know, there's a communal element to it. For you know? sure. It's and a social ex COVID, experience. Yeah, during COVID, it was the only place we could socialize. I'm not saying, yeah. you know, we were, we were hanging out inside of uh, Wegmans or a Publix and, you know, chatting all day, but it would be the only time you would actually see other people in your community or maybe, you know, just have a quick word with the cashier. Um, so that's, I think, something that, you know, Americans need to be reminded about. Yeah. And, you know, that's something that Amazon can't offer or can't offer right. as well. You know, we yeah. all know that Amazon now has brick and mortar and they're, and they're building more every sure. day. Um, so I think, yeah, that's the key point. Yeah, although I would say, and, and obviously this is just my own personal experience. One of the things I've noticed in our local stores is, you don't see people standing around chatting with neighbors and friends that they run into. We, we seem to be all business, right? We're getting in, we're very list driven, we're getting what we need and, and, and we're getting the heck out of there. And yeah. um, I, I wonder to, to, to what extent, and especially when you consider, and I'm gonna get to this in a second, but you got these local stores being used as, as e-commerce fulfillment centers. And so not only are you trying to dodge other shoppers in their carts, but you've also now got store associates in there doing the the the, the picking and the packing and, and preparing yeah. for for pickup or for delivery. So I had a conversation, it's been five years ago, maybe six years ago, with a then senior executive at Walmart. And I, I wrote this down and said Walmart's he he said Walmart's greatest competitive disadvantage is the super center. And and I bring that up because the article you wrote um, last week, it was on the 16th, about the new big box era. It seems like the the, the complete opposite of that is true. So I'd love to hear kind of your yeah. thoughts on on the new big box era, the 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 the, the Renaissance. Well, it's funny that yeah, that, that that executive mentioned that. I mean you could all yeah, you know. Of course, the super center was probably the greatest profit generating, you know, um, idea ever in, in, in retail. Um, but yes, can it be a competitive disadvantage? Uh, you know, certainly as stores get smaller and as e-commerce takes up uh, more and more of the pie. But then it's about, you know, what are you doing with those super centers and whether it's, you know, um, you know turning the parking lot into a COVID testing or, or vaccination site. Um, yeah. I know that's just a temporary fix, but then it's more about, okay, let's carve out some space in the back of a super center and put a micro fulfillment uh, hub there. And that's where things get really interesting. And that's something I've looked at closely over the past few weeks. Um, there's a lot of activity there, not just Walmart, um, Albertsons, Ahold, Kroger, everyone is kind of placing bets in terms of how do we optimize this online grocery thing. And that's, of course, the problem is that it is not very economical to have thousands and thousands of humans running around stores, knocking yeah. over your regular shoppers, whether they're from Instacart right. or their Walmart. So was it now Walmart now has a, Walmart now has 177,000 of, of people picking and packing online grocery orders. So you, you go to a micro fulfillment model, it's not a lot of capital investment to start, at least for a comp, certainly for a, you know, a, a publicly listed company. Um, not a lot of time, it's quick to set up. And then all of a sudden you're now saying, okay, um, we can do a hub and spoke model. We can get these orders out. Um, we can pick and pack a heck of a lot quicker um, than we ever could before. And so that's where the store again becomes, you know, you talk about sweating the assets. I think Doug and other retail executives, Brian Cornell at Target also talks about sweating the assets they have. Um, Target's another great example of how they're using their stores as distribution hubs. Um, north of 90%, you know, of their online uh, orders over the holidays uh, were fulfilled from the stores. And, you know, I remember four years ago when Brian Cornell talked about how important the stores were um, and the stores were going to be the center of their revival. I mean, a lot of people were chuckling. They were kind of laughing at him saying, what are you crazy, Brian? You know, this is Amazon's age. Uh, maybe it's time for you to start closing more stores. But no, you know, it's what you do with them. It's also how you build them. So with Target, it's small format stores. Those make a lot of sense in urban areas, 
um, in college campuses, for example, grab, grab shoppers young. That's a very smart move. Now, Walmart, of course, you know, we all remember, you know, that, that's poor went out for Walmart Express. You know, we know that never worked. Um, and so, you know, there's neighborhood markets, but there's really not much difference there between a traditional supermarket. So Walmart hasn't been able to go so much smaller with their regular boxes, but it's almost a case of, well, you know, do they need to, if you have the super center acting as this e-commerce hub, um, you know, do you need a smaller box or is it just a matter of, you know, really leaning into um, the, the investments that you're making now? And, and, you know, they've said they'll have 100 micro fulfillment centers. I wouldn't be surprised if that number and that target, you know, doubles, triples very quickly as we, uh, as the year goes on here. Yeah. So what are you the most excited about right now? What's, what's kind of maybe on the periphery that we aren't seeing and where, where is the next wave of disruption going, going to come from? And is it going to be the Amazon and the Costco and the Target and the, and the Kroger that is leading the way, or is it going to be some of these smaller direct-to-consumer brands? I mean, D2C brands have certainly been the disruptors of late. Um, yeah. You know, I would say, uh, you know, how many of us have a Dollar Shave razor in their bathroom or a, or a clipped toothbrush, um, you know, uh, or of course the mattress from one of the 9 million D2C uh, mattress companies that seemingly sprung up uh, overnight. Um, but, you know, I, I expect we'll see some, some shake out there, certainly. Um, and for a lot of these D2C brands, I mean, for example, our family, I'm just talking from my own experience, but, you know, we're kind of giving up on our Quip, our Quip subscription, you know, to the, to the brushes and, and the toothpaste. It just doesn't make as much. My wife told me the other day, she's like, ah, eh, you know, I think we're just going to go back to, uh, you know, the Sonic toothbrush. Um, so have the, have the D2C brands sort of had their moment? I don't think so, but as yeah. so much of what they do gets incorporated into sort of broader retail, as some of these companies actually bring their products into retailers, you know, Quip, of course, is is uh, is in Target. Um, we've seen plenty of examples of that. As they kind of get co-opted, um, you know, they become less disruptors and more just part of the regular sort of churn of retail. Um, you know, another sort of you know big trend we've noticed, or at least before the pandemic, you know, was rent to own um, and, and that whole that whole movement. Um, and it's particularly around fashion, of course. Um, and, you know, where that will, will go going forward, uh, you know, I, I'm sitting here wearing a collared shirt, I think for the first time in probably several months. So, um, you know, maybe it's uh, um, those disruptors were of, of course, maybe disrupted themselves. And that's one of the really interesting things we like to look at it at, at Bloomberg and, and anywhere else is when, you know, either the, the disruptors become co-opted by the existing industry or they become disrupted, you know, certainly uh, themselves. Um, but that's where it gets fun, right? It's sort of looking around corners. I think right now we're, we're trying to all sort of just take a breath, um, figure out, you know, of all the 10 million things we had to do on the fly last year because of the pandemic, how many of those 10 million do we really need going mm -hmm. forward? Um, and then which of these consumer behaviors are lasting and which were more kind of ephemeral um, mm -hmm. and, and are gonna go away? And I think that's really going to shape, you know, what type of disruption you're going to see. Um, you know, let's not forget there are certain trends that went on through the pandemic and accelerated during the pandemic, like health and wellness, for example. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about it. Health and wellness was, you know, even you know going into 2018, it was still for some a little bit more on the fringe. You know, Whole Foods exploded, but then got co-opted. Other supermarkets realized, hey, we can carry natural and organic food as well, right? Um, yeah. But then all of a sudden you have a case where being healthy and being sanitary is not just, you know, something for Brooklyn hipsters to do, you know, during the pandemic, it literally would keep you alive. So, yeah. you know, talk about something going mainstream in a hurry um, and whether that's, you know, eating well, reading, reading labels, you know, the clean label movement, I think it's going to improve even more um, companies like Oatly, for example, you know, huge disruptors there. Um, and, uh, you know, so much so that, uh, you know, uh, if you're good luck getting a, you know, a bottle of oat milk, depending on where you shop these days or yeah. finding if you, if you want it in your Starbucks uh, coffee. Um, so that's where, you know, sort of having access to companies like those is really helpful at Bloomberg telling their stories, you know, talking to experts, figuring out how much is hype, you know, um, and how much is, is reality. I mean, again, that's where it gets a lot really fun. 
Um, yeah. And these are the types of stories we want to keep telling. Yeah. You know, three or four years ago, I was at a, a conference here locally and it was Walmart e-commerce uh, executives on stage speaking and the, and the conference had a, a moderator and the moderator was inviting the audience to text him with, with questions. And uh, I thought I was really clever. I asked him the question, at, at what point are retailers unnecessary as intermediaries between brands and shoppers? And, and he, wouldn't, he wouldn't ask them the question. Uh, but now it seems like in, in a post-COVID world, these, these retailers have, have reestablished themselves, right, in terms of their, their importance uh, with, with consumers in, in, their, in their everyday life. Would you agree with that, that, that consumers are developing closer and closer relationships with, with retailers, even as all of this stuff is happening in the direct-to-consumer space and that, and yeah. that they're, not, they're not ever going anywhere? Yeah, and, and one way to really solidify that relationship with a retailer is to have a really strong, you know, store brand or private label. And that's just something that I really got to experience uh, working abroad, you know, where you've got companies like Tesco and Tesco's finest and, you know, uh, private label penetration there is well above what you're ever going to see here. And I know that's because the American brands, you know, they, they, they've sort of very much put it inculcated in our minds that you have to buy Coca-Cola, you can't buy, you know, Sam's Choice or Brand Brand X. Uh, that means you haven't made it as, as you know, as an American. And I, I think that's obviously a lot of hooey, you know. But yeah. um, you know, when we had dinner parties in, in the in the UK, you know, I would proudly put the bottle of Sainsbury's own gin out there for gin and tonics. Nobody batted an eye. I mean, you yeah. know, could you imagine, you know, doing that here in, in the U.S.? But maybe, right. you know, what if it's what if it's Kirkland Gin or Kirkland Bourbon? You still you do have certain store brands where they have that are so strong, they're bona fide brands unto themselves, and that that's something where again, where you can really solidify the relationship with the retailer when you have certain products there that you can only get at that retailer, and which of course carry higher profit margins for the retailer. So it's sort of you know it, it's a win win all around. Um, but sure, are there going to be brands that still don't need retailers? Yes. I mean, look at look at Nike and Adidas. Yeah. I bought a lot of stuff from Nike and Adidas for my son, who's a big you know big soccer freak, um, over Christmas. And I was going direct to their websites. There, they have amazing websites. Delivery was fast. You know, they have loyalty clubs in the same way that you know a regular retailer would do. But again, that that's few and far between a brand like that. And of course, you see it on the luxury side as well. Um, you know, whether it's Gucci or Armani or, or what have you, of course, I'm not shopping at, at those places as often as I am uh, uh, Nike and Adidas. Um, but uh, yeah, so, you know, you are going to see it. Uh, but I think retailers, you know, if the past five years have taught us anything is like, they, you know, and I think Walmart is emblematic of this really getting more serious. Um, you know, about their own, their own private label, having it be, a, you know, a bona fide brand rather than just, a, you know, a, a low cost alternative. Yeah. Well, and I guess the, the same thing is true today as has always been true, experience wins. And if you have a better experience buying your product direct from, from, from the brand than you would buying it from the retailer, then, then you're going to continue to do that. Yeah. I can't, I can't believe so much time has already gotten away, but one other thing I wanted to call out is in your article, you talk about diversification. You've already mentioned that to some extent. When I lived in uh, Japan, gosh, it's been 13, well, my God, it's been, it's, been a, it's been a while ago. No, 16 <laughs> years ago, 17 years ago, there were grocery delivery then, which I thought was a, a pretty cool thing living in, in, in Tokyo. And, uh, but the stores were already starting to see a lot of what would happen uh, much later in the U.S. as the, the need for the square footage went away and, and there was a tendency to really junk the stores up with lease tenants. They would just do anything they could to, 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 to use that space. And it looked like Walmart might've been headed that direction at some point, you know, trying to like, what do we do with all this space where we were selling, uh, you know, music and movies and, 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 and even, even video games. And I think they've gotten really smart uh, about it, but uh, one of the things that I noticed this week or, or I read this week was, you know, Amazon bought the what, 10 or 11 years rights to Thursday night NFL football. Yeah. Uh, so, so my question to you is what, what's the, what's the next front in terms of uh, the, the war between the major retailers uh, where, where they're going to be fighting for, for, for loyalty, you know, Walmart kind of seeding, you know, voodoo and that opportunity to engage with people at, at home uh, seems like, 
you know, maybe maybe Voodoo wasn't worth keeping, but it just seems like that's an area where where, where Amazon has such a huge advantage to be able to interact with with, with shoppers and their home it, from an entertainment perspective. But yeah. where's the next where's the next front of this war going to be going to be fought? Is it healthcare? Is it financial services? Uh, is it better? You know, is it all about delivery and and yeah. that that whole buying experience? What what do you see? I mean, outside of the, you know, the clear battleground of, of online and fulfillment and actually being able to turn a profit from a, you know, from, a, from an e-commerce order, which we, as we know, you know, Walmart is, is still not, you know, turning a profit in their U.S. e-commerce operations. And they've given us some timetables and um, kind of blew past those. But you're right, I think in terms of the battlegrounds, one is definitely healthcare. Um, and whether that's a Walmart clinic or it's Best Buy's move to outfit your home with your or your grandma's home with sensors, um, you know, emergency response devices, and have it all networked up and have a geek squad looking over it to make sure you know that grandma is safe, um, uh, whether we're in a pandemic or not. That is a huge deal. And as someone who went through that with my own uh, mother, I, I can certainly attest to that. Uh, or is it financial services? Um, you know. Uh, Walmart's made their move. We all know, you know, Walmart has plenty of financial services already. You know, it's not yeah. like they're getting into it, but they certainly right. want to get deeper into it. Um, and all of that generates, you know, whether you you are engaging with customers through healthcare or financial services, it's generating data. And it's that data and those eyeballs, of course, that are valuable to advertisers. So I think advertising is another front on this. And we've seen Walmart rebrand their ad business from what Walmart Media Group to Walmart Connect. Target has their own business called Roundel, which they've rebranded. Uh, Kroger has Kroger Precision Marketing, which is you know a legacy of their Don Hunby experience. So yeah. that's really getting interesting. You know, you, you look if you say you look over at what Amazon is, you know, getting the rights to NFL games. Do I think Walmart is going to you know buy the rights to NFL games? No. Um, but Walmart is going to be perfectly happy to be selling, you know, selling ads on its website, in its stores, uh, competing yeah. against, you know, not just, you know, uh, Twitter or Facebook. You know, why should Twitter, Facebook, YouTube be getting, you know, the lion's share of digital advertising? You know, uh, I'm sure there's conversations inside Bentonville right now saying, you know, how are we going to get more of this? Um, they talked a bit about it at their investor day. I think it was Brett Biggs or John Ferner who said, you know, they want to be as big as Fox or Hearst uh, fairly soon. I mean, that's those are the big, hairy, ambitious goals you want to hear from from retailers, uh, certainly. Right. So, again, whether it's advertising, healthcare, financial service, I mean, certainly, you know, retailers need to be thinking about, you know, how do you monetize the data they have, which I think retailers, American retailers, have not done a good job of historically. They have tons of data. And often have done very little besides, you know, loyalty programs, which are usually disloyalty programs because we all have 20 of them and we just play one off the other. Uh, but when you start to talking about, you know, going to a retailer for your healthcare needs and not just your, you know, your prescription, uh, you know, uh, your your blood pressure prescription, I'm talking about a deeper relationship um, around healthcare with a retailer. That's, you know, that's I think where it gets interesting and talk about an industry that's up for this, you know. Up for disruption, um, tons of spending in American healthcare, and it's not spent very well. You know, so who's to say Walmart's going to do any worse or Best Buy is going to do any worse? Well, I'm going to give you the the last word. Tell the the supplier community uh, how they can how they can help you, and um, and and if if they can't help you, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Sure, I mean you can help me just by talking to me. You know, <laughs> that would be fantastic. I know there's a lot of hesitation usually around you know talking in depth about uh, you know your experience with Walmart um, the last thing I want to do is get any supplier you know in trouble uh, with Walmart but just know that Bloomberg and me you know we are very good at keeping our sources confidential we are never going to publish anything um, that would you know come back to you in, in any way so all I would say is just you know let's open up a conversation you know let's talk it does not have to be on the record it could be of course a, a background conversation just tell me what's on your mind you know tell me what you think of Walmart's e-commerce strategy you know where are the holes tell me you know did this big integration of the merchandising division between stores and brick and the online you know did it how well did it really go you know I, I wrote about it at the time. You know, I'd love to talk to some of those, uh, you know, West Coast dot com merchants who 
uh, could either lose their job or they had to move to Bentonville to come work. You know, how are they doing? I, you know, mm. talk about fish out of water type of experience. So bottom line, yeah, just talk to me, you know, know that you know, we're very good at protecting confidentiality and, and sources. That's what we do for a living. Um, if we weren't good at it, you know, we wouldn't be, we wouldn't be in business anymore. Um, but it's more just about create, starting a conversation and a dialogue, you know, um, starting a relationship, you know, thinking less about, oh, is this going to be in a story or not? And just more about, you know, getting, sharing some opinions, um, because it's without those opinions that I, you know, I can't tell my stories. Yeah. And it really is a cooperative effort to help us gain, all of us to gain, you know, better, better understanding and ultimately, you know, make better decisions uh, about our own businesses. What's the best way to reach you? Um, anyway, I mean, the, a good journalist should not just say, well, this is the only way you can reach me between these hours. And if you don't, you know, if you, uh, if you call it another time, I'm not going to answer. Um, you know, it's, it's email. It's, uh, you know, you could get, get me on Twitter. Um, call me, you know, I, you know, <laughs> I'd love to have good old fashioned phone conversations and it doesn't have to be a video call. Um, that we, we have encrypted ways to, to uh, communicate as well. You know, if you want to, some people only talk to me over WhatsApp, you know, for example, which is encrypted. Uh, Signal is another encrypted um, communication platform that a lot of journalists use. So it just depends on the level of comfort of the person I'm talking to. Um, and just know that I will make accommodations. And what I forgot to say earlier is that to know that, you know, when we're talking, hopefully it's a two-way street. Hopefully I'm telling you stuff that you didn't know. Um, in addition to you telling me stuff I didn't know. So that's the worst, you know, a source journalist relationship should never just be one way, you know, and those relationships don't last very long. You know, sure. I should be telling you stuff that you don't know, um, giving you some, you know, some hints, some ideas, or just a little bit of, you know, Bentonville gossip, you know, that's always fun as well. Well, this has been so much fun. Uh, I, I've enjoyed it a great deal. And I can't tell you how much uh, I, I appreciate you making the time. Uh, Matthew okay. Boyle, senior reporter for Bloomberg News. Wish your wife a happy birthday for us and uh, have a great weekend ahead. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks a lot, Matt. Thanks, everyone.